martial arts isn't just something that you can fall back on. It is what you do and it is who you are. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Whistle Kick of Martial Arts Radio, and this is episode 350. Today, I'm joined by Sensei Jeff Doss. If you're new to the show, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can get show notes, you can check out the other 349 episodes, and you can learn more about what we do and why we do it. If you want to check out our products, you can find those at whistlekick.com. And don't forget, you can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. While we do offer free shipping and wholesale accounts with free shipping, if it's easier for you, you can also buy most of our stuff on Amazon with Prime Shipping. I think it's fair to say that everyone that comes on the show has something in common. They're passionate about traditional martial arts, and they share that with me. But once in a while, I get to speak with someone whose story seems so parallel that I wish they lived closer because I'm sure we'd be great friends. And today's guest, Sensei Das, is one of those people. We're similar in age. We had similar upbringings in the martial arts, a competitive career, and now we found a way to make martial arts our career, as well as our passion, as well as our lifestyle. And it was on those points that I found myself nodding along saying, yes, I understand this guy. Now that might not be your story, so you might not be nodding along in the same way, but I'm sure you'll be able to resonate with the passion that he expresses for his lifestyle as a martial artist. Let's let him tell the story. Sensei Das, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey guys, how are y'all? Thank you for having me and excited for just a great show. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. You know, I've been following you online. I, I've got a pretty good idea of what you've got going on. The th main thing I know about you, of course, is that you're a martial artist. You're a passionate martial artist. And I think anybody that has even met you, I'm suspecting, knows that it's a, a huge point, if not the focal point of your life. Is, is that a fair statement to make? Yes, it is. It, oh. it, it definitely is. Um, I've been involved for 30 years now, this wow. month. So this month? It's, yes, this month. Awesome. So pretty awesome. <laughs> cool. Cool. Well, you know, I'm, we never put so fine a point on it in this show to ask people's ages, but I'm going to guess that that means you started pretty young. Yes. Yeah. I started when I was four. I'm 34 now. So yeah, it's uh, pretty exciting just to keep going back and, uh, and, and remembering some of those uh, great experiences that martial arts has taught me. Mm. So I've been now, doing that a lot lately as well. <laughs> really? In, in what way? Uh, I, I'm working on some different uh, projects, uh, working on uh, a podcast and, and about the, some of the teams I was on when I was younger and different moments in sport karate history and things like that uh, as Sport karate and competition was a big part of my life. And uh, that has been something just kind of thinking about all those details has been really cool to uh, go back and think about, okay, this was, I remember all these things and all these things, but what did I learn from them? And mm. I think that's what's uh, really exciting uh, to do that. Um, as well as um, I do, you know, Facebook Live video five days a week uh, with my show Morning Questions that, uh, I enjoy doing so. <laughs> oh, awesome. Awesome. You know, you and I have a bit in common, you know, we, we've got a morning show um, as well. And we both started at four years old. Yeah. And I've got a couple <laughs> years on it, not, not enough to really make it, make it different. But one of the things I know is that when I started, when you started, it was uncommon for people to start at four. Exactly. We didn't have the little dragons programs. We didn't have three-year-olds running around using, you know, blockers to, to understand how their body <laughs> works the way that we do today. So what was it for you? How did you get started at four? All right. So it's kind of a funny story. And, um, uh, I was a big, uh, pro wrestling fan. So my favorite wrestler was Ricky, the dragon steamboat. And he used to come to the ring with a karate gi and a belt and, and all this stuff. And, and he did some exciting moves, you know, high flying and really good wrestler and his focus was you know family respect honor and as a kid i, I was all right i gotta be like that guy 
And so my parents uh, found, tried to find a place for me. Um, and when we went in there, I started for a week and they were like, I don't have a class for him. And it was uh, my uh, master, Lawrence Arthur, who was uh, the instructor there. And so he just pretty much said, that, hey, I don't have a class for you. I tried maybe, you know, he tried to make it work. It just wasn't going to work. And so I found like a, like a rec program with inside like a dance studio or something <laughs> that, that I did for a year. Yeah. Um, two weeks after I started that, Master Arthur called my mom and said, hey, I got a class now for him. Bring him in. He's like, oh, it's too late. We already did that. Um, what's funny about that is years later, that's who ended up being my uh, instructor. And I got my first black belt from Lawrence Arthur, Master Arthur, uh, years later. And so it's, it's funny. I always joke with him. Yeah, you kicked me out, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you wouldn't accept me, you know, when I was younger. So it, it's, it's funny. Um, and then my, my brother also started when he was four as well, too. And so, um, and I remember, I mean, they made a big news article about him in the area of being the youngest to get a yellow belt and things like that. Just, um, it's still even at, trying to think how old he probably it was probably 91 or something it was still rare for that age you know um to do it so it's just completely different i mean on on how it is now i mean i have classes where i have toddler programs you know <laughs> so completely different yeah yeah and <laughs> anyone that's ever taught kids that young knows that you've got to completely throw away your expectations not only of what you would teach in a typical martial arts class, especially a traditional, you know, karate, traditional Taekwondo, et cetera, program. But right. sometimes you have to throw away everything mm -hmm. because three-year-olds don't follow any kind of agenda. <laughs> right. Right. And yeah, you just got to simplify it. You got to have maybe four or five moves <laughs> uh, that go. And I mean, even this past year we did what we call baby ninjas. And so it's like a one to three-year-old program with their moms. And you know what? I mean, it, it's it's just great for them to learn how to use their body and the balance and things, and just to get them excited doing something that they feel cool doing, you know. And then it it makes it easy when they get into that little dragons program. They're like the best student because they already they're not scared to get into the dojo. They're not you know which those three year olds when they're trying to get into it are. So I mean, I know it's. Some people were like, man, that's too young for this and that. I'm like, yeah, but it's not like I'm having them spar at one or two years old. You know what I mean? So you're, you're trying – the earlier, I think, the better. So mm, I completely agree. Now, plenty of people listening are familiar with those Little Dragon, that, you know, three to four, three to five-year-old right. demo. But I'm going to guess that statistically most schools don't have that. Even fewer are going to have anything for, you know, one to three. Right. How did, how did you come up with that? Uh, I'll be honest, it was my nephew. So <laughs> my brother, uh, uh, let's see, he's three now. So my, my brother's son. And I was around him pretty much every morning. And, you know, just started little things, doing high blocks with his hands and doing kicks and stuff. And he loved it. Uh, and he would just sit uh, with me and watch me do, teach my private lessons and just be in awe. And so, uh, I would, I would do certain things like, you know, just getting his legs moving and stuff. And I realized like he was able to, you know, walk, walk er earlier and, and his leg strength was better from doing different things. like just putting his feet on my chest and pushing me back, you know, just simple things that you can do with your kids and not, you know, hurt them. And, uh, then we just found a way, okay, let, let's see what happened. And then. <laughs> I didn't really expect for it to be such a big thing. I mean, the first month we had, had 16 babies in here. It was insane. It was crazy. <laughs> but uh, but it, it, was a, it was a good thing for the either parents or the uh, grandmothers to do with them. And just fun stuff. We put some things to music. We did a lot of obstacle courses. Um, we did a, a lot of things with them and their parents just doing different things together, like them moving their arms in certain ways. And, and stuff in their legs and stretching and stuff. And, and then it kind of evolved into, you know, something else. So it, it's, a uh, it's worked out pretty well. And, um, I mean, it, it's one of those things that's just, uh, 
it's different, you know what I mean? And and one of those classes that kind of goes up up and down, but you just gotta expect that with with business sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I'm completely fascinated by it, and I don't I don't want to dig too deep into it because again, the majority of our listeners are not school owners. The majority of, right of school owners aren't even going to want to have this kind of program. But it sounds like you know we'll talk later about how folks can get a hold of you. But it sounds like you are putting some of this information out. Yes. So if people want to yeah. learn more, cool. So we'll circle back around to that. Yeah. Where I want to go now, though, is, you know, you started at four. Here you are at 34. Yes, sir. Did you stop? Did you take a break at any point? <laughs> no, I did not okay. take a break. Yeah. All right. And that's that's what's uh, crazy for me. And, and yeah. um, I think, let's see. And, and I even have talked about that. Uh, with some of my students and some of my um, instructors and I told them that hey like you that have taken a, a break like that's a big deal and I need that in my system because you can relate to those kids that maybe are thinking about quitting more than I can because I never really went through that like I just loved it. um and you know I th and the same thing of those that have quit and came back so uh the only thing that I did want or maybe let's see I did maybe take a year off of competition one time, but I still was doing martial arts and, um, and really a year off for me was still doing five tournaments. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's some people's big year of tournaments, but for me, that was like the least I've ever done. Wow. <laughs> so, right. yeah. So there, there's something, you know, people ask me often, you know, what, what is it, what is it about martial arts for you or why did you start, you know, and, and, you know, maybe you have, kind of the same same response i don't know what my life was before martial arts so right. it's really hard to put it into context it's hard to empathize as you just expressed i don't know what it's like it, I, I can't relate i can try intellectually right. i can but i can't really relate to people who are looking at coming in as teenagers or as adults or looking at leaving right as those ages right so, yeah exactly it's it's a uh, it's just a different thing uh, thing for me, um, especially being from a small town like uh, Rustburg, Virginia, where I'm from, uh, 1,500 people. So it's it's small. There's surrounding areas and stuff. Um, and we're outside of Lynchburg, Virginia, which is a bigger, bigger city. Um, <clears throat> the majority of people, you know, they do baseball. They do football. That's their normal thing. Um, and they, and if they're doing something with karate, they think it's just another sport that they'll do for three months or something, you know? And, uh, when they get in here, they realize it's much more than that, especially when they like meet me and then meet my instructors and my students here that are, uh, kind of the same way, you know, like they've, they've uh, taken that same approach that I have as far as this is not just an activity or a sport I do. This is a lifestyle. And, uh, it, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see. Um, and it does inspire me that I'm doing the right thing when I see, uh, my students, you know, with that same mentality. So pretty awesome. <laughs> completely agree. Now you talked about competition. You talked yep. about how much you've competed. I mean, you kind of alluded to that. Let's, yep. let's talk about that. Cause I've, you know, just from the bit I know of you, it's really hard to separate martial arts from the competitive side for you is that is that fair yeah it, it is fair um for me i i don't think i would have stuck with it as much without competition it's something that kind of that uh helps me uh just stay focused and have another purpose um but i was always real good at separating you know the difference and you know knowing my self-defense knowing my my curriculum my my forms uh being able to learn new things like wrestling and grappling, and then also being able to focus on competition, like my forms and my weapons and my sparring. Um, I started really young with competition as well, like everything. So five years old, um, did underbelt competition regionally until I was about nine, got my black belt really young at nine. Um, then I decided, I was going to start touring nationally. And at 10 years old, I started touring nationally. 
even my coach at the time said I didn't have a chance and I'd be lucky if I got in the top five and I won my first five tournaments. So it was kind of crazy. We were kind of like off to the races from there. <laughs> wow. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was from there. It was just, it was a way for me to have goals and, and keep me on track. You know, like if I had stepped off at all, when I had a tournament every month and I didn't uh, do my training or I didn't keep my mindset right, or then it was a direct way for me to see, hey, you're not doing this or, hey, you are doing this. That's awesome. You know, there, there was a way for me to track that. And, um, you know, once you get to that level, especially at that time, there wasn't really much uh, once you got your black belt. You know, I mean, there, there was your degrees and stuff, but there were no other programs or things like that uh, in martial arts. Now it's a lot different. You know, some people have like the hyper program. Some people have an actual sport karate team. Some people have demo teams. Some people have leadership programs, uh, certified instructor programs. I mean, there's so much now that we have because we've learned that, hey, we want to keep our black belts. You know? yeah. <laughs> we want to keep we want to keep people in martial arts. And uh, for me, uh, competition was that. So. Um, and I mean, I can go on and on about competition. I've, I've done a lot because of it. Um, it's helped me. I've traveled almost every circuit. Um, I've, I've won a lot. Um, and I enjoy teaching my students, uh, now to be champions as well. So, <clears throat> and as well as I also put on a, a national tournament and I help with the sport karate league as well. So. I've kind of taken to the next level of not just competing and being a champion or not just coaching and being a champion um, and coaching champions, but putting on events. And uh, I have yeah, a national tournament called the Grand Slam Open that's usually around April. And then uh, I also help run the NBL, the National Black Belt League. And I also have a real big part of it in the Southeast. Um, we have different events that we put on and um, so every tournament that I usually go to, I'm the head coordinator and I, I, I have a, uh, a lot of responsibility to make the tournament run smooth. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And anybody out there that has ever coordinated a tournament knows how challenging yes. that can be. <laughs> yes, it, it can be. Yes, it, it can. And, and I, I learned a lot from that too, because I, I have, uh, I have to understand, um, and I think martial arts has taught me that too, and just life in general. Uh, that, you know, I'm there, I'm doing a job and I can't take it. Like, you know, if we don't have the judges, if we don't have this or that, that's not my fault. I can only do what I have the tools to do. And a lot of times I, I tend to put it all on myself. Like this is all my fault, blah, blah, blah. No, you're, you're there to do your job, do your job and, and do the best you can <laughs> and have fun. Don't, don't look miserable. <laughs> <laughs> right. If you're not having fun, no one is having fun. Exactly. Yeah, it's, I attend a fair number of events, you know, I, I don't so much compete anymore, but, you know, with, with our endeavors here at Whistlekick, you know, it finds, I, I was at a competition in Connecticut yesterday. Yeah, yeah, uh, just, I, I know that, I can't think why I can't think of his name right now, but Her, Herbie, Bagwell. Yeah, Herbie Bagwell, yeah, Herbie Bagwell, yes, yep. yes, yes, awesome guy. He's a, he's a great guy, absolutely, uh, hoping he'll come on the show at some point, um, reaching out to him shortly. But, you know, one of the things that is, is very apparent is that, as you said, you, you can't manifest referees. You, you can't, right. stall, you know, the air conditioning dies or the heat <laughs> won't shut off, you know, whatever. I've, I've seen, I've seen everything, <laughs> I think. Oh, yeah. I, I'm yeah. sure you have too. Yes. But it's, <laughs> I mean, there, it's a perfect anecdote for martial arts, comp, the, the actual in-ring competition aside, because you do what you can with what you have. Right. Right. Exactly. Very true. Very true. Yeah. I mean, and, and you just, you got, you can't let it uh, affect you because again, you, you also have a business side of it too, you know, and, and, and just a public relations side of it. And, and the biggest thing is, you know, if things aren't going the well, you know, you know what, get a smile on your face and, and make someone else smile because of something else. You know, <laughs> Like that's, really what you need to do instead of just stressing about it. And how can I make these judges a pin out of thin air? <laughs> it doesn't right. work. <laughs> right. It, it, it does not. Now you brought up a, a, a piece that is rarely discussed when we talk about competition is that it's a business move. 
right. a, a competition right. that habitually loses money will not continue to exist. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know about you, uh, but I don't know too many people who are willing to just burn money over and over again. Right. So, um, you, and yes, go, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree, and I think we see that far too often in karate tournaments. Um, I, I think uh, competitors and family members and things think that all these promoters are making tons of money, um, and I know a lot of them are not. That's why there's a lot that have stopped doing tournaments uh, over the past five years, just because it was just, and I don't think it was just that it was they weren't making money, but either the work that they were putting into it was harder than that, what they wanted, you know, and they had to figure out what, what it, what, what way, um, was it worth it for them to put that time and effort into that? Um, but yeah, I think, uh, it's a tough business because there, the event, uh, fees for you to rent a building are going higher and higher and higher every year. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then so in response to that, yeah, we have to raise the prices on competition. And so that makes it tough. Um, it, it's one of those things. I mean, I think you see that with, with business. And, and for us in martial arts, it's the same mindset. <clears throat> People, oh, anyone who charges, you know, a lot is a McDojo. Or anyone who charges too much at a tournament is just trying, you know, they, they, uh, they're just money hungry. and really. That's, I don't think that's the case at all <laughs> because we're just trying to survive and make it to where we can, uh, we can make another year happen and, and make an event that is worth it for you. You know, um, there is a big difference in, uh, someone said the other day, like the shoebox karate tournament and then the professional karate tournament, uh, you know, where you just pop one up, put some rings on a gym and do everything by cash and, Hey, you know, that was it. There, there wasn't much to give away. There wasn't much to do, much planning. If there's some scorekeepers there, that's great. Uh, between the ones who plan it for a year. And sometimes the ones that plan it for a year, you know, like it works out one year, one year it doesn't. Um, it's just an up or down process. And I mean, I love it. It's, it was my thing when, when I decided to do a tournament, I wasn't going to do it small. Like I wanted to, I mean, I worked my way up, but I had a five year plan that I wanted to be a national event and that happened in three years because I put the work into it and it, I wasn't just, I made sure that I had people in place that wanted to help me as well. So my mom was in charge of this part of the tournament. My brother was in charge of this part of the tournament. I was in charge of overseeing all of it and some of the other things. Then I had two or three other schools that would help with this or that, you know, it was just, it's more than, just doing it yourself. Um, and I think the earlier you understand that, the, uh, the better it'll be. So. Yeah, completely agree. <laughs> Let's shift gears from competition. We'll come back. We'll talk a little bit about you and, and your personal experiences with yes, competition. Yes, yes. But when we think about you and, and your life, because you have lived a martial arts life from, from four to 34 with no gaps in between. I mean... The first couple of years of anybody's life is really just walking around like a bobblehead. You know, we don't <laughs> we don't we don't have a lot of experiences that really kind of register that we remember. So when we think about those 30 years and we think about martial arts, what's the best story that you could share with the <clears throat> listeners that comes from that time? Uh, let's see. Man, there's so many. <laughs> um, I mean, I can get through into a lot of different ones as far as uh why it, it um you know why it's it's kept me where it is and a lot of that too is uh, my faith as well just um i know it goes hand in hand and and i just feel like this is what i'm meant to do and and as, even with i think for me it was after college um trying to figure out uh what i wanted to do and I always was saying, I got to do something different than karate. I got to do something different than karate. And uh, I went in uh, at Radford University and I graduated uh, in sports administration. I wanted to work within an athletic department and do that. And actually, my main thing was to work my way up. So 
So that way I get to a point within 10 to 15 years to where I had contacts to make sport karate a big deal. And my first job after college was working with the rec department and I just hated it. (laughs) I just thought, yeah, it just wasn't just where I was at, just the, the people were interacting and just the mindset of, this is as good as it get. No, don't try doing that. No one will like that, you know, and, and that just wasn't me. And so I found an old bar <laughs> in Rustburg, Virginia that I could turn into a karate school. <laughs> so did you say this, an old bar? Yes. An old bar. The old bar <laughs> yep. An old yep, bar. Here that, in Vermont, we have old barns <laughs> that might turn into a, a martial arts studio, but a bar. Okay. I, I, yeah. So, a bar that had been sitting for about three years without anything going on. And we decided just to to make it happen. And so we've been here for over 10 years now. And that for me was going back to like who I was. Hey, no, martial arts isn't just something that you can fall back on. It is what you, you do and it is who you are. And you know, it's kind of, you know, again, yes, it's like my business story, but it's really my martial arts story because it's me realizing that this is who I am. And that, I mean, once that happened and it, it, it was just great for me because I felt like I, I just stopped limiting myself on a lot of those things. And even to this day, I've still the same thing. It's like push yourself no matter what, you know, you can do, you can do anything you want to do. Um, and again, you get the things from people uh, around town. Like, oh, no one needs uh, karate. No one needs that. It's not going to work. You know, this is too small a town, blah, blah, blah. No, it, it, if you have that determination, that passion for it, you can do anything. So um, it's been exciting to, to see that. Yeah, I mean, just turn something from, you know, again, like I said, a bar into <laughs> a place of growth, you know, and that's what we've uh, what we've done here. And looking forward to do the same. Uh, I mean, there, there's just so many things that martial art. I mean, I think that for me is that, that story. Uh, once I opened my school though, uh, I got better. I mean, competition wise was funny is that I was a great competitor for a year, for years and years and years, consistent one of the top ones, but I didn't become one of those people that, you know, were the best, at the tournament um like you know always for grand champion until i opened my school and i think that that was great for me because it put me into a point of martial arts is my life and to where it's you know and just the routines and the things of just doing this and doing that and the more you teach the better you get i mean i think it's it's really exciting to see that actually And some people don't realize that. I think, oh, I don't get to train as much or I don't, you know, but when you get to understand what, how to make not just one person better, but multiple people better in their own way in different ways, then it's pretty easy to do it with yourself because you know yourself, (laughs) you know? That's a great way to put it. And of course, anyone that's ever had their own school knows that while in one sense, your personal training tends to suffer because there are only so many hours in the day. Right. You are getting better because you're teaching fundamentals. You're always right. teaching the basics, that that foundational information. And the analogy that I like to use is you can only go so high with a certain foundation. And the more time you spend with that foundation, as it gets stronger, broader, however you want to look at the analogy, the higher you can go. And that's what happens when you're teaching because you always have novice students. Right. <laughs> right. So you've always got to be working on that stuff. And, and here you're articulating that. You know, is it fair to say that when you opened your school that you were spending less time on your training personally? I think so because I was at that time where I was doing – I was working at a, um, like a recreation facility. And so I worked there. I was just getting out of college. I was still kind of, I, I call it like the college hangover, trying to figure mm. out what to do, what, you know, and still trying to be young at a certain, you know, enjoy the the time that I was doing. Um, and just not sure of, of what was next. I was still going to tournaments, but I was going without much training. And that was, I saw the flaws in that. 
But once I engulfed myself into what I was doing, it was like, hey, man, I have, you know, just open mat here all the time. I can train and whatever I want. Um, now, the bad part is when some people, it's not a bad part because it gets them into it, but some people open school saying, well, I have a, I'm, I'm going to do this that way. I have a place to train whenever I want to. And that's great as well. But you got to also understand that um, the whole, the point of it is that you need to use that mat time to help yourself grow. So that way you can help others grow, not just to make yourself grow. And that was it. You know, um, the more you grow and the more you, your martial arts gets better, then the potential for all your students to get better just, you know, doubles, do, you know, triples, quadruples, whatever you know, whatever, how much you grow, your students are going to, it's the same thing's going to happen. So. Mm. Completely agree. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Outside of martial arts, is there anything that you're passionate about? Uh, let's see. Um, is there time? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. I, let's see. I'm trying to think right now as far as, um, you know, I have about four different things that I'm involved in. All of them have to do with martial arts and things. Um, I, like I said, I'm still a, a big pro wrestling nerd. So I, I do, if I have any time to listen to a podcast or something, sometimes I'll listen to something like that. Um, I'll listen to a lot of different business things and martial arts, uh, things. So those are kind of like my things. Uh, I really enjoy spending time with my family. Um, I've always been a fan of, of music. So I enjoy doing things like that. And then uh, going to the gym and working out uh, separately from my martial arts uh, is something I enjoy as well. Mm. So. What could martial arts school owners and competition promoters learn from professional wrestling? All right. So <laughs> well, you sound what? like you had that queued up and that was. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 this, this is not we did not discuss this. ahead. Of time. <laughs> I just had a feeling. <laughs> so for me, um, well, there's different things. If if uh, so, as a competitor first, especially as a form or even as a fighter, uh, I think doing intros is very important. I think we need to do that in all of our finals, all of our grand champion competitions. Intro music, something to get everyone hyped up. Uh, you know, we, we've seen how the UFC has grown as far as on that part from that. And, I mean, even the other night having smoke during <laughs> the uh, Conor McGregor entrance and stuff that you wouldn't have seen before. Um, that, it, I mean, that is – I think it's the same thing. I mean, it, that just gets people emotion. It get that entertainment level. You know, it, it just does something. It elevates it. Um, for me – that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to do great martial arts as a competitor, but innovative and creative and do something that people and, and, and people were always wanting to watch me because they didn't know what I was going to do. And so I would come up from underneath the stage sometimes and I would hide behind the judges and then jump over their heads uh, before I would walk in to do my form. Things like that. You know, I do the, I broke, a, sorry, I used to hit, my head over the head with a water bottle right and then uh, before i entered that was my signature thing when i was doing forms open forms then it became maybe i'll just make the water bottle bigger and bigger and bigger <laughs> and you know i had a big jug at one point uh at one time one tournament i got one of the big like water container things <laughs> and empty one and hit that over my head just crazy stuff uh to where then i would break a board over my head things like that because I feel like if people aren't watching, like you could have the best form in the world, but if no one's watching you, then it doesn't matter. It didn't exist. You know, it's kind of like in this world that we live in now. If, if you don't have it on video, it doesn't happen. Right. right? <laughs> it didn't happen. Yeah. Um, kind of the same type of thing that like you got to get people watching you. And that's pro wrestling is the perfect, uh, you know, comparison to that. Um, now, as far as tournaments, I think, yeah, I mean, the way we sell things, the way that we, um, you know, creating superstars, I think that's very important. And um, the, when I started my tournament, I wanted to have set fights and set things like that. And I, I found different people that say, hey, I want to make you the star of the tournament this year. 
And that was really cool to, to see um, because some people take it in one way that, oh, you're showing favoritism to this person. And I don't really see it that way. I see that, hey, I'm giving you someone here that you can aspire to do. And then guess what? Next year, maybe this could be you. You know, it's, it's a goal to go after. Um, so, I mean, I, there's, there's so many things that, that, that you could do from it. I do think the forms competitors, uh, especially creative ones, need to watch more pro wrestling because I think that they will get more uh, the showmanship uh, part of it, the intensity, the facial expressions, uh, selling, you know, th- that type of thing. I think they can learn a lot from. So, <laughs> I agree. You know, and this is, this is a subject that is so challenging. It's so nuanced because on the one hand, what we see from your extremely traditional, as you call them often, shoebox tournaments, Right. Is that even the people there to compete are bored 97 percent of the time. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And then you've got another some would call it extreme where you have smoke machines. And I I will guarantee there are people that cringed when you said that you jump jumped over (laughs) the referees to enter the ring because that's not traditional. That's right. That's right. That's not traditional. <laughs> and there's certainly room for extremes and there's certainly room for middle ground. But one of the things that we've brought up on the show, one of the things that I am, I am incredibly passionate about is finding ways that competition can appeal to people beyond the competitors and the people that are there in the seats because they love them. Right. If we so, look at so true. nearly every competition, every, nearly every martial arts competition, I suspect on the planet, but I can't speak to those. I can speak to the ones in the U.S. Everyone that's there is either competing or loves someone that is competing. Right. I mean, that, that's that's it. Yeah. Yep. There's no and, outside audience. Yeah. And when we talk about any economy, I'm going to get a little, little bit nerdy here for a moment. When we talk about any economy, if the money that is going around in competitions is only for martial artists, it can't grow. Right. We'll never have these grand you know, fifty hundred thousand dollar prize purses that we could have if we developed a product, a competition product that appealed to people so much that they were coming, even if they didn't check one of those boxes, even if they weren't a competitor or loved a competitor. Somebody say, you know what? It's Saturday. Let's go watch the martial arts competition because I went to one last month and it was an amazing day, and I paid. 10, 15, 20 dollars to get in. And I sat there for eight hours and there was m- too much good stuff to watch. Until right. we can get to that point, we won't grow. The only ones that win when I hand you ten dollars and you hand it back, it's the IRS. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um I think part of it, uh some of it is like we we grew too fast. Or we're not too fast, but in a certain way, like I think we've divided our divisions up way too much. Uh, at a point, I remember when I was younger, there was seven forms divisions for juniors, and that was it. Now, just for forms, for black belt forms, there is probably, I don't know at a NASCAR term, it's probably 50, um, maybe more than that. Um, at NBL, it's probably 30, maybe more. Um, but when I was younger, it was seven divisions. You know, you had your eight and under, your nine to ten, your eleven to twelve, your thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, seventeen, your two musical divisions. That was it. And there was twenty to forty in your division every time. <laughs> uh it was easier from a competitor, I mean a spectator standpoint to understand that. Okay, this is that division. Let's sit and watch these forty people go at it. Oh man, this is awesome, blah blah blah. I mean, I remember being at the Battle of Atlanta and there would be tons of people on the floor there'll be a lot of people watching and i have talked to people in my local area they're saying oh have you ever been to battle Atlanta? i heard that was the tournament i heard this 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 i'm like are you in martial arts no i had a cousin but i just i watched it and and this and that and i think that kind of had something to do with it i mean i know we've tried to divide things up and i also agree with dividing things up by style and everything else but we've almost hurt ourselves to be able to get tv involved if we have so many divisions 
where it's just like, all right, well, let's just watch the grant. And that's kind of the way it's become, right? Mm -hmm. I don't really want the outside people from the, uh, that aren't involved with martial arts to come during the day. I'd rather them just come to the finals. That's kind of sad, actually. I mean, I know we, we, we should um, push our finals and our shows, and that's what that's for. Um, but we've kind of done that out of necessity because we don't really know how to present the daytime in, in a exciting fashion besides on just this is the way it needs to be done to get done on time. Right. <laughs> do you get what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that is often discussed as a point of pride is how early a competition right. finished. And right. you know what? I don't think there's a bigger indicator that something is wrong than an event is done early. Yeah. Not choice. Right. It, no. it, it's not a thing that you have to do. It's a choice. <laughs> and if it's not a full day of entertainment that you are kicking people out from, you're probably doing it wrong. And we're all doing it wrong. Right. Yeah. I'm not, we all I'm not, I'm not yeah. suggesting that anyone uh, has it right and, and, you know, everybody needs to copy that model. But I think we need to spend more time looking at how we can diversify what we offer so it is more broadly appealing. Yeah. And, and I think some of it too is it's hard to understand. Um, I think they can get behind. Honestly, the open forms and stuff because it's exciting. It's similar to like a, um, you know, skateboard and, and and BMX and stuff that got popular for a while. And I think that you know is exciting to some extent for them and the weapons and stuff. Um, and even I think breaking is pretty easy for someone to understand. Hey, they broke her. They didn't. Oh man, look at this guy. He did fourteen. Um, and I. And I think depending on who you're watching doing traditional forms, you can tell if that's good or bad, you know. Um, sparring is, is different, though. It, it's because, especially right now with MMA and, and kickboxing and boxing, you hit someone, you knock them out, or you hit them more, they won. Um, it, it's different. It's, it's the, the whole thing of having good technique and scoring a good point and things like that are, are different. Um, to someone who is not within the sport, you know? Right. So. Right. And we're um, not going to solve it today. No, no. And, no. and you know, it's something <laughs> that we'll continue to work on because the business model here for whistle kick is pretty straightforward. If it gets people into martial arts or keeps them in martial arts, we're going to work on it. That's awesome. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Let's, let's bring it back to you. We're, we're doing a great job of talking about you and it's spinning out and talking about martial arts in, in a more, broad sense and that tells us a lot about you and your personality yes, sir. let's yes, sir. let's pull it back let's talk about you and let's talk about something on on the other side of the spectrum we've talked a lot about the positive aspects of your life let's talk about something you went through that was difficult but something that your martial arts experience however you define that mm -hmm. allowed you to overcome so all right, we got several different ones. <laughs> um, I actually talked about it on my show this morning, right before I came on here. Um, my, what is your life changing moment, and what was one of those? Um, for me, my first big one was after in 1995. I was 11 years old. Uh, I won my first NASCA title. I was super excited, um, and then I had a rough end of that year as my Grandma, grandpa, and great aunt all died in a car accident. Uh, and that just changed my life because I have never gone through that type of, you know, trauma or loss um, right before Christmas time. Just a, a lot of different things. And um, for me, you know, my martial arts and my faith that I was doing this for a purpose um, pulled me through because. Uh, you know, it gave me something else to think about and to focus on instead of just the negative and that life does go on after uh, hard times. And, and that just because that was a tough thing and that I lost those people doesn't mean that I have to be lost, you know, and doesn't mean that I have to always dwell on that situation. I can, you know, uh, have those those tough times that that happen in my life and 
use them to fuel uh, me to to move forward. And so that was, you know, I had a lot of help with that. Uh, I went through a lot of different things because I, I get in these stupid little habits and stuff that I do. And so when I'm nervous or stressed out, you know, like biting your nails or uh, chewing on your lip or something stupid like that. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I would do that. So I learned how to get through those types of things from that experience. Um, and, and, and just, you know, for me there, I think I got more into martial arts after that um, because I, I just knew that it was, it was helping me. Um, I just tested for my, I think my second degree black belt as well, right? Like a week after that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a really tough test. I even kind of broke down and, uh, just, you know, overreacted on some things. I remember my anger and my, uh, was not right and was not respectful. Um, but my instructor knew what I was dealing with and he let me come back in and said, all right, you ready now? Yes, sir. I apologize. You know, um, I, and, and again, I, I think, uh, those moments sometimes, are, you know, even though that was a disrespectful thing for me to do to get upset my, my instructor because he was pushing me too hard. Um, sometimes those are what you need though, because you understand, you know, uh, you got to have those moments first before, you know, you move forward. So, um, that was, that was one of the things for me. Um, another one that, um, uh, I guess I'm not necessarily proud about was in college. Uh, I, I just gone around the, I'm not going to say the wrong crowd, just typical college stuff. And, uh, I got alcohol poisoning, uh, being stupid and, um, really a life changing moment for me to, I, I was not really focusing on my martial arts. I was not focusing on what I needed to do. I was just trying to figure out the new environment and the new world that I was in. <laughs> And so that really uh, pulled me back in to say, okay, reassess what you're doing. Let's think about it. Um, you know, a lot of prayer, a lot of, um, a lot of just going and doing martial arts by myself. I think that was what was hard because I didn't have a school. I didn't have that community. I didn't have people around me that did martial arts. And that's where I think I, I kind of started, you know, losing that. So. When I got into that, back into that environment of being training with people and doing things, uh, it really, you know, brought me back, and not just brought me back, but helped me move forward. And so, I mean, I, I think that's what's really cool about martial arts is that it is a, it's not kicks or punches. It is really learning how to grow yourself inside and out. So. <laughs> mm, I like that. That's a great way to put it for sure. Here's a question for you. If you could train with anybody, any martial artist that you haven't anywhere in the world, anywhere in time, mm. who would that be? Golly, that's a hard one. I'm sure most people probably say Bruce Lee. Uh, they do. They do. <laughs> uh, that's a tough one for me. I'm going to go in another way because again, my uh, uh, wrestling and stuff. And I like a lot of catch catch wrestling and uh, as far as we do a lot of that in my um self-defense is uh i'm gonna say gotch so frank gotch um was the father of what they call catch wrestling and did a on, on how to do the submissions and the takedowns and things like that and so i i think that would really be cool to uh, learn from someone like that that does something different than what i normally do um, and that way I can just, uh, improve on that as well. So. All right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I've heard that name. Yeah. You have to look right. them up. So. You're going to have to look them up for sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, catch wrestling yeah. is, is cool stuff. I've talked to some people, I've never done it, but I've talked to some people who have done it and it just, it sounds almost like this, this, missing link that we could include in what most of us define as this kind of realm of traditional martial arts that right would be a pretty big i i look at martial arts as like a trivial pursuit pie yeah you add, you add wedges you add these pieces in that kind of round out and that's why i like that analogy your skill set and it it's always seemed like catch wrestling would be a really big piece mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah it, it really it it is um because it goes back to even like 
Greek and Roman times of wrestling and things. Um, so it's pretty, pretty cool to, uh, to see that, you know, that there is other martial arts besides just the, the Asian types, you know? Right. Um, and I think we forget about that. Another one, one more though, would, would be, I would love to have trained with Funakoshi. So mm. that would have been awesome as well. So as a Shotokan, uh, practitioner as well, I think that would have been awesome. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it seems like the more time we spend as martial artists, the more we learn about people that we want to train with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's similar to how I look at this show. When I started the show, you know, I had a certain knowledge of martial artists. And if you go back, if you look at the early episodes, you'll see that it's a lot of people from the Northeast because I live in yeah. Vermont. I grew Sorry. up in Maine, yeah. went to college in Massachusetts, <laughs> right? So the people that I knew were primarily in the Northeast. And I had people that asked me, well, how many episodes are you going to be able to do? How many people do you know? And my concern was, was right along there with them. Am I going to be able to keep this show going for a few years? And what's happening right now is, you know, like we're recording this episode. It's not going to go live for over a month. Right. <laughs> because there's a backlog and there are so many people. I, I just this past weekend, I got to know several people that, oh, man, they need to come on the show. Yeah. And the challenge <laughs> now is not, do I have enough people? It's how do I decide between all these wonderful martial artists? <laughs> on the show and that's kind of the same thing you know as you get to know about wonderful martial artists who do you train with right <laughs> right exactly right. exactly it's it's uh it's really uh and i think there's so many different ways to do it as and to think about it as well but they're they're just you can learn something from everybody you know um i think Sometimes, you know, that's why I think it's important to have open mats and let other schools come in with you. Um, I think some people are still in that mindset of school versus school, and that's my competition. And I'm really against that. Um, there are some schools that feel that way about me and feel that way about that. And you know what? That's their opinion. That's okay. Um, but hey, I think we can all work together because. Really, the key thing is to get people involved in martial arts, and that's it. That should be, you know, your main thing. Um, we're more competing against the other sports or actually the other activities that kids and people are doing um, than we are each other, you know. So I think when we start thinking that mindset, we need to understand we can learn something from everyone. Uh, I could call Jody Tension on the phone and ask him for some advice on this tip, you know? And even though I think that my kicks are really good and I know all the stuff I need to, to make someone a good kicker, I could still ask him for some advice on that, you know? Um, Cause he may have something different than what I'm doing that may help me and vice versa. Um, or Raymond Daniels or someone in, in California or someone in another country. Uh, we got to put that ego aside and, and understand that, uh, we can all learn from each other. So, fully agree. And here's how I explain that to people who don't, who aren't on the the side of the table that you and I are. I'll ask them: Would you agree that fast food restaurants, these juggernauts, understand business and marketing? And they'll say, "Yeah, okay." Where do you find every Burger King restaurant? Right next to a McDonald's. Right. If they get it, if they understand it, yeah, I don't think there's a better example. That's right. <laughs> That's right. It's so true. I mean, there's different flavors, different things that people like, but it all, all comes back to martial arts. You know? so. Right. so let's talk about you and, and what you've got going on. You mentioned at the top of the show that you're working on a podcast. You mentioned that you've, you do a Facebook Live thing. I think you said every day. So tell us what you've got going on and how people can find you online. All right. So I, um, yeah, I do the show now called Morning Questions in the Morning. Just a, a quick kind of thing to bring it back, you know, bring it back around. Of It's, it's a kind of a mindset show, but also um, we'll talk different topics with martial arts, life, everything. 
but the main thing is I, uh, I've been doing a lot of different uh, audios and classes with uh, Michael Burnoff. Uh, and the biggest thing was that we got to stop making statements about what our life is. And we need to start asking questions. Uh, the answers are in there. And so I was like, you know what, what if I do a, a show just like that? And we just have different questions that we ask ourselves. And how do we find those answers? You know, cause the answers are in you. Um, you just, uh, you got to keep asking the right questions and more questions. So, uh, that's kind of how that spawned. It's some, it's not too long. I do five, five, 10 minutes at the most. I don't, you know, it's about around eight o'clock, eight Oh five, uh, depending on where I'm at and the traffic at school and everything. Uh, but, and it's just been fun just to connect with different people, uh, through it. I mean, I have some loyal listeners that will make sure they're always, <laughs> uh, watching. And then some days I'll have different ones and, then I have people that watch it later on and, you know, it started out of something, uh, for me to just let people know who I am, you know, and be vulnerable. It's not just me being this great person. I mean, that's not what I want people to do. I always usually try to bring it back to myself on some way that I can improve, um, and learn from what I'm talking about. And it usually comes from something that I did wrong that I need to learn. So, um, that is what I do on Facebook. Uh, my Instagram is Sushi Grand Slam. And same thing, I kind of put different things up there with that. We did a kick challenge earlier last week, two weeks ago, uh, with a lot of us that are over 30 <laughs> and that we're going to make uh, kicking videos. And that's gotten kind of crazy. I mean, from that video, I mean, I've gotten so many different messages about doing some uh, more videos and more uh, shows and seminars and stuff. So you never know. I mean, you, if you just put your heart into something, people are going to notice. So that's exciting. Um, it's, and then, yeah, uh, let's see, I have all my different pages that I have on Facebook, my Grand, Grand Slam Martial Arts, uh, Jeff Dosh Grand Slam Open, which is the tournament page. I also have the NBL uh, National Black Belt League page on Facebook and Instagram. So I have a, a lot of different ones. <laughs> You're so, all yeah. over the place. Yeah, I'm all over the place. Um, I am trying to, I just started doing just a, a short little part podcast that I do. Um, that's called kick of the day. And I'm currently working on a longer episode right now that is about, um, team elite team elite was a team that I, my first big team that I was on, uh, in 1996. Uh, till 2004 and it spawned into it was team elite and then it turned into cjb so it was a a really big uh team that i was a part of so i was kind of going to go through the whole different parts of that of that story um because i mean we had some of the top fighters and foreign competitors in the world on there and just to go through what uh you know i was 12 years old what that perspective of a kid through that time in my growing process. And, and I was a team captain. Also, my mom ended up becoming the manager of the team. So I know a lot of different things about the behind the scenes stuff that maybe, you know, people would like to hear. So, um, and who all was on the team and what they were like in person and what they were like during that time of when they were growing and becoming stars. You know, I mean, we had, we had Jody Tension when he first really started coming out, you know, Nash on the national scene and to really tell people about what he was like then and how he grew to that point. And, uh, Anthony price on his last year of competing, uh, what kind of a veteran and, um, leader he was. So I'm excited about doing that. And that's kind of how I've been really reminiscing and, and figuring out, man, what I learned a lot in those days i'm definitely blessed to uh be able to uh from a small town be able to travel um and see the things i did and interact with the people that i did from different cultures and different uh cities uh, i think that's what's really cool about karate is because it's universal everyone can relate to martial arts and it doesn't matter what language we have what religion anything uh we can connect on martial arts i couldn't so. agree more 
you know, and folks, uh, that was a lot of links, so don't be afraid yeah. to drop those over <laughs> yeah. for show yeah, notes. Sorry about that. No, no, sorry please don't that. apologize. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If anybody's new, we'll have links to all all that stuff that Sensei Dawes has going on. So no, no need <laughs> shot onto your arm in <laughs> blood while you're on the treadmill or something ridiculous like that. <laughs> but I appreciate you being here today, and I'd love for you to send us out with one final thing, the way we always ask our guests to, to send us out some parting words, some bits of wisdom, however you want to think of it, send us out. All right. So two different things. One thing I want to talk about is and send out is that um, I heard this message the other day. I think it goes for all of us instructors. And I, I read this in a book, uh, five, uh, sorry, The Five Levels of Leadership by John C. Maxwell. Great book. So just you, just you guys to get that. Um, and it talks about uh, a teacher that was, uh, you know, she taught math. And she realized that math, it wasn't that she was teaching math. She was teaching kids. And that's what she said. She said, I teach kids, not math. And I think we need to understand that when we do as instructors, that we teach kids, not martial arts. When we try to go in and just teach them martial arts, they're not getting it the way that we need to they need or they're able to to learn it and so i think we need to understand that we have to go outside of our realm and do something a little bit different and learn different things and then our martial arts will bring us back around you know and, and help us uh so as far as a teacher that that is um one of the tips that i think uh we all need to kind of think about especially if you're teaching students uh, kids same thing if you're teaching adults you're teaching them so you need to relate with them uh and the last thing is um just don't give up guys um martial arts is just an amazing thing it's it's helped me so much it's blessed my life and i mean i i just uh i couldn't uh do do anything without it i, I know that it's uh it's put me in a whole nother level in life and the confidence that I have because of martial arts. Uh, as a young kid, a small kid, uh, being able to just have learned that, that, have that courage to push through anything that's put in front of me, um, you know, there's nothing like it. So thank you guys so much for having me and hope to uh, talk to you more. And you guys can check me out on Facebook or. Uh, instagram and i will respond to you and uh, talk to you anytime it's not easy to make martial arts your life and it's even harder to make martial arts your career but here we have a man who is fighting tooth and nail to do that i have no idea how successful he is financially because we don't talk about that stuff that's not my business but i have every understanding of how impactful he is from his social media, from the scope of competition that he puts on, and of course, from his words here today. Thank you, Sensei Das, for coming on the show, for sharing so much of who you are with the audience today. And I hope someday soon we get to meet and maybe even train together. If you want to check out the show notes, hit whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're there, sign up for the newsletter, maybe head on over to whistlekick.com, shop for a shirt or some gear or a uniform or whatever, and you can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. If you want to follow us on social media, that's whistlekick, at whistlekick, there we go, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and you can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I thank you for your time. I thank you for sharing your ears with me today. Until next time, train hard, smile and have a great day.